thank you guys all for coming out today. Um, my name's Dave. I'm from QuickBooks. Um, I do growth marketing for our online SaaS product. Hi, I'm Nicole Smith, and I'm the founder of a startup called Flytographer. And Fly... <laughs> hey. Fans. <laughs> I like sorry. that. That's a nice welcome. Um, so Flytographer is an online marketplace that connects travelers with local photographers in 175 cities around the world. So it's sort of like the Airbnb for vacation photography. I'm Daniel, I'm with Public Works and Government Services Canada, and we are interested in late stage innovation. <laughs> and to answer one of your questions about gender equality, we are exactly 50-50. And our director is a female. <laughs> a lot of energy on this side. <laughs> Come on, this side of the room. Come on, wake start. up! Pull your, Let's pull your go. boots up. Jeez. I'm Rob Bennett. I'm the CEO and Program Director for Viatech. My main responsibility, thanks Yvonne, my main responsibility is, is running the accelerator programming that, that we've got here. We've been running that for uh, just over four years now. Uh, prior to that, I was an entrepreneur and I've, I've had a couple of, of companies myself. And um, so I have some direct experience in, in the trenches. So the, the cool thing is over the last five or six years, it's been more as observer and, and mentor, um, nurturer, supporter, uh, than directly involved. It's not often I feel short next to people either, but I do specifically today. So let's talk a little bit about how each one of your organizations, I guess for you and you as an entrepreneur in the community, what's the role that you are playing um, in the local Victoria community? Either personally or as an You're looking at me, so I'm I looking guess, at you. You've I got the microphone. I'm, I'm going to start. You've got the microphone, so. Thanks, Dave. So, um, so our role is is really that nurturing and supportive role. So, a, a lot of the people that that join our, our program are first time entrepreneurs. A lot of them have an idea about something they like to develop, but they haven't developed a business. So, there, it's very different to develop a product or a service as opposed to developing the business. So, a lot of times people will come to us asking for help on developing the business. And the first thing that we, we do with them is get them to start talking um, whether they actually have a viable idea or if it's just a, a cool thing they want to build. So that's an awful lot of, of where we start. And then it's really the community that comes together to, to support and, and, and help the entrepreneur build their company. And so we do, we do a lot of, of connecting with other people in, in the community. Um, and I guess you can sort of think of, of Vitek's role as, as fill in the void. So one of the cool things that's been happening in the community recently is there's a lot of, of other organizations and individuals, entrepreneurs, that are, that are starting to offer different sorts of, of programs or services. And so what we do is we support them instead of offering those sorts of, of programs or resources directly. Um, so it's a really fun role. Vitex is constantly changing, and it's it's one that that takes um, second seat to the to the entrepreneurs and what they're trying to achieve. Daniel. So as being part of government procurement, we're always looking to add new suppliers to have a lot of small businesses being part of the supply chain. So we go out, talk to businesses every day. We have them on the phone by email. We also talk about uh, the Building Canada Innovation Program, where we support late-stage innovation. So the federal government is interested in uh, buying late-stage innovation. It's kind of a competition. You, up, you apply everything is uh, done online. And you have a civilian stream and a military stream. So I guess our role is really just to grow as a startup and to really um, you know, find and nurture local talent. Um, and really sp spread our footprint around the city. Um, because I think the more startups grow, you know, the better off it is for the whole tech sector here. So we're completely focused on growth. Um, but I, I do like to add that when I travel, it's really exciting when people say, where are you from? And you know, we say Victoria. So I was at a conference in, in, in France in, in December with the travel industry. And people were really surprised to find out our, our startup was from Victoria. So it's great to sort of change the perception out there that, hey, a lot of exciting things are happening in Victoria. There's a lot of interesting startups, um, you know, brewing here. And so I, I'm, you know, really excited to be a part of that. Let's talk about that specifically, about mm -hmm. the, the local community, the region, everything that's coming out of Victoria specifically. And how, what is the current state, in your opinion, of, of the ecosystem around Victoria? 
I, I'm really bullish on the state of Victoria right now. I think it's at an interesting place where you're starting to see a lot of people move from bigger cities to start their companies here, and that's a combination of you know, housing prices and you know, other factors, but I think people are realizing it's a great community to raise a family. It's a great you know, place to live you know, just in terms of, of a, you know, a nice mid-sized city with all the amenities, but there's also a lot of talent here too, and I think um, that's something that I think is gonna continue to get better and better over time. I know there's still like a lot of jobs that um, are out there and people are having trouble recruiting for, but the, the talent and then you know the, the developers, the, the knowledge workers in the city is gonna continue to grow as more startups come and make the bet on Victoria. Dan, Rob, either of you guys? <laughs> Thanks. So, um, like she said, so okay, no, Thank um, you. <laughs> So a lot of people don't understand that um, the last economic impact study we did, we found that there's $3 billion a year of revenue being generated every year by tech companies right now. Um, and that's, that's grown substantially um, from about $1.7 billion, which was the uh, study we did five years before. So it is, it is the largest single economic uh, engine that's in private sector based. Um, and so... That's awesome. There's also responsibility comes with that because it is an, an important uh, factor here. Um, we employ 15,000 people directly in, in tech um, in, in these, these companies. And um, that, is, that is part of the message that we're, we're, we're trying to get out. It's certainly part of the message that, that people in, in Vancouver are now hearing about. Um, it's, it's incredible. I was, I was speaking with uh, Tony Melly earlier and he said there's, there's in all the companies that he supports through IRAP, almost all of them are hiring at least one person from Vancouver over the next month or two. So because of some of the changes happening there and because of the awareness that people are, are, are gaining through, uh, through the obvious success of companies like Flight, Flightographer, um, there is more of a spotlight being, being shone on Victoria. The other thing that's happened recently is there's a number of exits that are taking place. And so we have sort of this, this first round of entrepreneurs that have built companies very successfully and are deciding to double down on Victoria. So they're staying in Victoria because, like Nicole said, it's a great place to, to raise a family. And so they're still young enough that they've got families that they're, they're focused on. And they're investing in tech. They want to invest their time and they're, they're investing their money too. And so it's a really, really healthy and exciting environment right now. Sort of, it's a, it's a version two of, of what's happening in, in the tech sector. It's all shun sunshines and lollipops and roses out here. There are no in, problems in, in Victoria. Out, <laughs> out east, when I asked that question, both Ottawa and Toronto, and immediately they were like, we have this problem, and this is disconnected, and that's disconnected, and we need this and that. Um, but it's cool to see you guys have this kind of camaraderie um, here in Victoria. But let's talk about things that aren't sunshines and, and, and lollipops, but what are some of the challenges that the community is facing right now? Well, the weather's not so good today. This is a little unusual. It was minus five when I left Toronto. So. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the reasons why you're sensing the, the camaraderie here that you may not sense in other areas is the community's had to do this itself. There hasn't been a lot of outside involvement. You know, I, I look at some of my counterparts in different regions around the world, or around Canada, and, and the millions of dollars they get to support their programming, and we don't get that, right? So, so Vitek has a very interesting business model itself. So it, it owns this building, but it does so in a, in a way that it actually adds to the financial s sustainability of, of the programming. We get some government funding, but it's not sufficient to offer all the, all the, all the programming and resources that we have, so we actually have membership and, and sponsorship revenues that come in from the community. So it's, it's very much a community-based organization. And one of the really cool things is when someone has an idea about a, a group they want to, uh, to form or um, a, a, a different um, session like a, a, like a boot camp that they want to run, something like that, they come to Vitech asking about how we can support that. And it's really cool to support uh, an entrepreneur that wants to, to do something in the community. I mean, that's one of Vitech's roles is to support that. So because we have a, a long history of, of doing that, 
um, we seem to be the first place people come to to, to look for support. Um, and so there hasn't been the, 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 the fractioning that's taken place in, in other communities. And we're also at a really good size too. So we're not, we're not that big, but we're not that small. Um, and so, so there is this real large community involvement. So it'd be great to have, have more money, but quite honestly, I'm not, I'm not sure what we'd be, we'd be doing with more money. Uh, more talent is definitely something that, that's needed. Um, and so raising awareness about what the opportunities are in Victoria is, is certainly something that, that the companies themselves do, but it's also one of our strategic objectives as well. So I don't know, maybe Nicole would have a more honest answer. Okay, Nicole? Yeah, I do, right? That sounded like a lot of sunshine and lollipops, <laughs> no, actually. I, I, I agree, like, in terms of the, you know, the funding um, is an issue, but I, I think the biggest challenge for me in my particular startup is, is access to talent. Um, you know, we, for example, had a job listing for a developer, and it was like six months before we found someone that was a fit. In a bigger city, you're not going to have those kinds of issues. Um, I think part of the solution to that is really a PR campaign around how awesome Victoria is. And I know that Tourism Victoria is doing some great work in repositioning the city from the nearly dead and, no, nearly, nearly wed and nearly dead to like, it's actually an, an amazing place to live. It's an amazing place to raise a family. We all know that, but we need more people to know that and, and understand that, you know, betting on Victoria, moving to Victoria and, and, and seeing the great breadth of job opportunities available. I think we need to really market it better. Is there, and this is completely from a East Coasters ignorant point of view, but is there a competition between Victoria and Vic Vancouver for that talent? Is that one of the problems? Because neither of you <laughs> called it out specifically. You said bigger cities get all the thing and like there's a really big city right there. Is that part of the? I think, I think there's definitely, you know, um, groups of people that prefer the big city energy, but the trade-off right now in Vancouver, as we all know, is that you end up, you know, with a two-hour commute if you want to buy a house because the affordability factor. So I think that's that's an issue for Vancouver, right? A big issue for Vancouver right now, and a big opportunity for Victoria to sort of, you know, tap into that. And how is the relationship between the two startup communities? Between oh, he's just passing it back to you. Um, but between. We don't uh, talk the, about the, that here. The ecosystems in Vancouver and the ecosystem in, in Victoria. So one of the interesting things the province has done is provide uh, funding to venture acceleration programs across the province. And I believe now the, the count is 14 different partners. And there's uh, three different partners in Vancouver. There's Wavefront, Venture Labs, and Foresight. And, um, and so, there, so we are partners. We get together regularly. As a matter of fact, last week we had an EIR summit where the executives and residents from all around the province got together for a day and a half to uh, swap stories, share, share best practices, have meals. Um, no drinks. N not allowed on expensing. Nope. And, and, so, um, and so there is, again, this, this great level of collaboration. And it's not that we're all the same. Um, we offer the, the Venture Acceleration Program, but it comes in different flavors depending on the region. So we truly do learn from each other about the different experiments that, that each of us runs. Um, that said, there is a difference between Victoria and Vancouver. And it depends on what side of the moat you're on as to uh, what perspective you have. I have taken companies over to various venture forums in um, Vancouver and, and there's very little respect given for companies that come from Victoria. Because there is this mindset, and I wouldn't say it's just in Vancouver, there's a mindset of the newly wed, nearly dead. You, if you're any good, why would, you, why would you be located in Victoria, right? And there is so much evidence to the contrary to that. It's amazing how many world-class companies we have here, not just startups, but companies. But a lot of people don't know that because why would they? They live somewhere else and it's not something that, that's on their radar. Um, so there, there is a difference. It's not something that we've ever tried to compete with Vancouver about, but what's really weird is now the right people, the people that have the open minds, that are willing to do the research about what other alternatives do I have to living in, in Vancouver, they're discovering Victoria. And so, and there's a lot on the web you can discover, right? And you, you come to some of our events and, and you start to learn just what the, the community spirit is like here. 
Um, and people are discovering it. So it's not, it's not an outright challenge or competition. I mean, there is a difference. Um, and, you know, we are competitive people. But um, I think people are, are slowly but surely finding. So I think, I think as the stories get out, as, you know, Vogue magazine yeah. talks about Tectoria, <laughs> the talent thing will start. I mean, we've got some great universities here and colleges, so there's a lot of new talent being created. But really, when we say talent, what we're looking for is that experienced talent, right? Three to five years experience, right? So let's shift the focus a little bit from the startup ecosystem from a community level and down to the ecosystem for the individual startups? So I started my company three years ago and my background is I spent 15 years in global marketing at Microsoft. So very big company, the opposite end of the pendulum. Um, I'd worked in a startup before but it had been over 15 years in kind of a different dot-com era. Um, and one of the first things a friend of mine told me to do when I was telling him about my startup, he said, you need to talk to Viatech. You need to like connect with Viatech. So I met Rob, um, I met Dan, and I went into their uh, accelerator program. And I think if you are starting a startup, you don't have that background or experience with the startup, it's a great way to you know quickly up-level your skills across different functional areas that you may not be strong in. So you can not only understand like, you know, the importance of you know, market validation and really you know, getting that product market fit, but even having like functional expertise on the legal, the accounting, the marketing, all those different sides. So I think that's, you know, in terms of the ecosystem, that's a great resource to tap into. Um, you know, for me, it's always been talking to other startup founders that are at the same stage and also a little bit ahead. So you can kind of commiserate and, 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 and connect with the people that are going through the same stage of growth um, as your business, but then it's also great to have mentors and people that have, um, you know, that are at different stages and can kind of understand the journey that you're about to take and be able to give you feedback about that. So those are some of the, I would say, things that, that we did. And uh, from a mentorship perspective, how, how important are, are mentors? It keeps coming up as a theme in all of these chats and um, people have different mm -hmm kind of views on them, but what do you guys, what, what are all of your takes on the importance of a mentor? I think it's critical. I think it's so important. I think it's good to have a variety of mentors, not just one. Um, maybe a mentor that is in a similar space. Um, maybe a mentor that just um, doesn't have any skin in the game with regards to your startup and can really give you that unbiased viewpoint. So I think you know, it's it's a relationship. You need to just find people that you connect with and, and build it slowly. But um, for me, it's been it's been absolutely critical. So, yeah. Well, to work, try to work with all the different federal and provincial government programs you have available, like IRAP and uh, concierge service and other. Yeah, mentorship has also gone through a bit of an evolution around here too. So, again, provincially they tried to put a, um, or they didn't try, they did put a mentorship program in place before they came out with the Venture Acceleration Program. And so there's all these volunteer mentors, very, very experienced uh, people that have moved in the community that have different industry experience, different company experience, and uh, they were very, very involved. And then um, the province put this Venture Acceleration Program in place and one of the features of the program is a um, paid mentor called an executive in residence. And then those EIRs, as we call them, get assigned to the different companies in the program. Well, once you have a sort of dedicated paid mentor, it meant that the other mentors weren't being used as frequently. So there's, there's been a, an evolution that's taken place in, in that space. That said, we still have quite a few mentors that, that attend various um, various functions when we're, we're interviewing new companies coming in and when we're reviewing their quarterly progress and at different events. Uh, but mentors are a really, really important component of the, of the community. And for me, they're also a source of our next EIRs because the EIRs are typically involved in the program for six or 12 months and then they get involved with some other project and I got to bring someone new in. So very, very important component to the program as well as to the community. So mentors are super important. Get a mentor if you don't have a mentor. But how do you get a mentor? If I'm a startup and I'm like, I want a mentor. They, all these guys are telling me I need a mentor. Do you just go out in the street and yell? Like, wh how do you, how do you find ask, one? Ask Nicole. Nicole, how do you find a mentor? <laughs> well, I, I think that you know, it's it's going. 
going out and talking to people and, and telling them that you're looking for a mentor would be you know the first thing and explaining what you're looking for. Um, participating in local startup events is a great way to meet new people and get closer. But I mean, it's it's literally you're just it's like any relationship. You need to um, you know spread the word, meet as many people as you can, and make sure it's a fit for both of you. So I think it's not going to come find you. You got to go find it. And one last one, and then we'll open it up for a couple questions and leave some time for that. But what do you guys see? You all deal with a lot of startups. Uh, what do you guys see as maybe the one or two biggest gaps that that most guys starting out don't understand? Or girls. I didn't mean guys like that. Um, building something and investing a lot in it before you've actually really figured out product market fit and whether or not your customers, it's something they'd actually pay for. So I think that's that's the one that I see as being the biggest issue. Dan? The issue we have seen is that people don't even have, sometimes don't have a clear picture of who their market is, who their client is. And I think that's the gap they have. Rob? Okay, I'm going to say it a third way. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at, uh, at Lean Canvas, the two outer boxes are top two or three pains or problems and market segmentation. It's getting that right, right? Which is the market segmentation and it is the customer validation before investing in the rest of the boxes um, ahead of product market fit. So I would definitely say that. Tied up in a nice little bow there. Anybody have any questions for these guys before we let them go? Oh, there's a couple. We'll go in the back first because that's you. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to say, okay, no, I'm, yeah. Oh, okay, I need this. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think the city of Victoria has to do to kind of help with the momentum that you guys are involved with? I mean, again, I said, if you look up, uh, there's a lot of vacancies in our city. There's a lot of there's a lot of places that we could fill with great things, and it's not happening right now. So, what does the city or the government need to do to assist you? Well, I think money is always a good thing, right? <laughs> I'm open to that. So, um, you know, for example, we just learned about a week ago from a, a friend of ours that. There's this grant you can get. It's a youth employment grant. So you hire someone who's under 30 and um, hasn't recently been on unemployment, and you get like $3,000 just for hiring someone. So maybe, you know, programs like that are great. Uh, more awareness when there are programs would be great too because we, you know, we didn't know about that initially. But I think, yeah, anything financially that they can do to help us. But I, I, again, going back to the PR point, I think that Victoria, I mean, Tourism Victoria is doing a great job promoting the city right now. I think we need to do the same thing with the tech sector lens and let people know what's happening here, why this is a great place to live, why this is a great place to start your business, um, and, and have that message consistently out there. And, um, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to resonate. I'm going to take a stab at that question, Yvonne, behind you. Oh, good. So you. Peter Elkins from the Capital Investment Network. I interact with a lot of different groups, as Rob does in the city, and what I'm finding is there's an interest that's switched in the last, say, year, where people want to understand what's going on in this new economy. And the simplest thing we could do as a sector is actually facilitate conversations with people in the community that just want to understand what's going on. And so we a lot of the commercial developers, for one, they all want to know what's going on now, and they have no idea. Um, a lot of the investment, the bankers, all these people are starting to show up looking for information. So it doesn't exist. So as a public entity, when you say the city or Viatech, one of these government-funded or government organizations, facilitating that conversation is the first step. And that's a good idea for the university. <laughs> Next question. Hi, uh, my name is George. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur, and I'm just curious, uh, it's more directed towards Rob, but I'd really appreciate any input. What are some of the characteristics of, uh, of, of a startup, really in its early phases, that you like to see before accepting them into an accelerator program? And I'm, uh, any input is really appreciated. Interesting question. So, George, basically, 
These are all investment decisions that get made, right? Even getting accepted into the accelerator program, it's really an investment of time and resource that's being made in that, that early stage company. And what you'll hear, regardless of any sort of um, investor presentation that, that you hear, people like to invest in people. So the biggest thing we're trying to figure out is uh, how much effort have you already put in? So we're looking for proof of, of how much research and, and effort you've put into really understanding the, the pain and the market segmentation part of it. Um, and we're trying to figure out the degree of coachability, right? Because some people want to get in the program for different reasons. Like they think that there's, it's a mark of credibility or something. It's not, right? The credibility comes from the entrepreneur. And I can tell you that, that from, from the executive in residence meetings we have, executives in, in re residence love to work with people that are just you know sponges. They're taking it up and they incorporate it with other advice they might be getting from other sources too, and then they act on it, right? And as, as long as we see that sort of effort going in, even if mistakes are made, because mistakes are generally how people learn, right? So as long as that forward progress is being made, it's, uh, it's a good investment from our perspective. So right from the, the intake interview all the way through, as, as we work with companies, we're continually looking at what the effort is, does the person deliver on what they say they're gonna deliver, and is there continual forward progress? Yeah, there, there was some brief mention of government uh, grants and things, but I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit on what, uh, expand a little on what types of government funding there are for, for startups. It's actually the wrong person up here for talk about startups for the government. It would be actually our colleagues from the concierge service. So I would Google concierge service, contact them. There's three of them in Vancouver. They do an interview with you to look what's, uh, what's about you, about your company, about your venture. And they will tell you focus on those five government <coughs> programs. Is there like a landing page on Vitex website that lists out all the different, you know, local, federal, provincial um, grants that startups can apply for under different categories? Is it sort of, is that data centralized anywhere? Fundica. <laughs> Fundica. Okay, well, perfect. Because that, yeah, I think more people need to know about that. And of course, they're changing all the time, too. So we're into a new fiscal year, government fiscal, and so there's, there's a number of new programs and some other ones have disappeared. But uh, yeah, we, we have that knowledge. We have it in a, in a slide deck, but no, it's not on the uh, Fitech website. Go to Google Fundica and then it's literally a tool where you can put in what kind of comp business you are, where you're gonna be, what kind of things you do, and it gives you a list of all the ones that you might be eligible for. We got one down over there. Yeah, my... Um my US VCs seem to be very edgy this year in terms of uh, talking more about cockroaches than unicorns. Um, how is the feeling here in Victoria around that? Like, is, are we looking at going into another sort of ugly period here or does that not affect us? I can tell you in 2008, when it seemed like the rest of the world was burning, the uh, tech industry here continued to grow. Um, so we, we do a, a, um, uh, a, uh, an activity every year called the Vitech Top 25. And with that, we get the, um, the revenues of those top 25 companies. And that top 25 have continued to, to rise upwards and to the right uh, every year except 2008, and it was because one of our larger companies, Spreva Pharmaceuticals, got bought and was removed from that analysis. And if you, if you factor that in, the trend actually literally continues up and to the right every year. I can't predict the future, um, but given the diversification in terms of industry in the, in the Victoria tech scene, uh, as well as the, the up and coming players that I, I, I know are in the works, I would doubt it but I, I don't have a crystal ball. I have a question for Rob. So how do you, um, in your program, how do you keep reinventing yourself and making sure you're up to date and learning new, um, new skills, you know, how to convey new information, how to reinvent yourself and move forward with the entrepreneurs year over year? 
I have many masters. <laughs> so it's just literally continually talking to all the different stakeholders, our clients in the program, our, our collaborators and peers and partners in, in other programs, uh, through networking events, and just continuing to learn. I mean, it is definitely continuous improvement and learning. Our EIRs are also a real good source of that too. So we get together with them regularly and, and certain of them will make certain suggestions that we have to follow up on. I'm looking at Hannes right now. One, one of the questions that I've, I've always come up against and, and often talking about startups and Nicole can probably, how do you deal with the factor of the, what I call the starve up? Where you're basically, when you start out, you have you have no livability, and we heard that in the panel this morning, yeah. and, and and that's never addressed by the startup community. I mean, people need to live; they need to have food in there, there, and then you've probably had to go through uh, that. Yeah. And ha and how can we facilitate that to advance that better and get? And so it's a real startup. So you so their brains are working, but they're not starving at it. I, I love that question. Um, so I think it depends where you are in your life stage. So for me, when I started my startup, I was a mom who worked full time um, and had a household burn rate that you know was a certain amount. So you know you can't just drop everything and have no income for a while. And so that wasn't an option for me. And so I kept working full time at Microsoft and I worked on my startup at night and on weekends for the first year and a half. When I got to the point where I saw enough traction um, and was able to hire my first employee, um, you know, I, you know, I, I just knew at, at there's an inflection point where I knew that this was going to take off and it was time to sort of leap off the cliff. I'm so glad I did it that way. The only regret I have is not hiring someone sooner. That because in terms of like I can you know make money over here and then I can you know get someone here to help execute on some things for me. So I wish I had done that sooner, so I wasn't so burnt out. But I'm really glad that I didn't just throw it all out and and just work from the very beginning with no salary because of the stress. I think that you have that stress if you can't float your own personal burn rate and you're um, you know also trying to like take on a new market and launch a startup. Uh, you almost have to be a superhero to make that work. So, the what, what, what would you say that we could change that dynamic so that, that can be facilitated? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure I know the exact answer, but I definitely think funding is, is something in, that can be help, you know, helpful for, for founders that maybe have a little bit of seed money to when they have a great idea that's vetted by certain, you know, criteria, you know, more opportunities like that. Um, but yeah, I think you know that it's a worthy discussion point for sure. Okay, one more question. Last question. Last question. Wait, 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 wait. All you people that are from another town. What do you think is a long commute? What do you think is a long commute? Come on, hour and a half. That's a long commute. So we think that's twenty minutes here. We think that's twenty minutes. So. I don't really care about all the rest of it, <laughs> but you guys should tell everyone where you go to just that one thing. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is gravy. The, re <laughs> the rest is gravy. All the kids, all the fun. I was born here. It's great. Don't even worry about that. Right? I've worked in every other city, Toronto, all over. Here is good. And you should tell people, not us. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.